Today we're speedrunning through Pokemon Legends Arceus, and we start the speedrun as soon as we choose a name for our character. Then right after this, we get a bit of cutscene dialogue where we're talking to Arceus until we see some light and wake up on a beach next to some Pokemon. Here we get introduced to the Pokemon professor of the game, Professor Laventon. He asks us a few questions like who are you, where are you from, and other random stuff that we have no answer to since we have amnesia. But before we can explore that more, his Pokemon randomly run away and we go after them. On the way, we also pick up a smartphone which lets us talk to God, so that's pretty cool, before catching all three starter Pokemon and getting invited to come stay at Jubilife Village, where we can help the Galaxy team with finishing the Pokedex, something we'll talk about later. When we make it to Jubilife, everyone makes fun of us for being an outsider, and this dude even refuses to let us in his restaurant. But through this rude gesture, we meet our rival Ray and Silene, one of the leaders of Galaxy Team, before Silene offers us a place to sleep for the night. The next day, Silene decides to give us a test to see if we can enter the Galaxy Team, which according to Ray is way too hard because he's kinda trash. But we need to catch a Bidoof, Starly, and Shinx. And to help us, Professor Laventon lets us take one of his starters, and we take Oshawott. Also at this point, you might have noticed that this game has a lot of unskippable text. It's pretty awful from a speedrun point of view, but I'm just going to paraphrase the dialogue as we go through, so at least you don't have to suffer like I did. But finally, it's time to start catching Pokemon. Well, in a second. First we need to fight Volo, a merchant who appears a lot in the story. And since both of our Pokemon are really weak, we kind of just tackle his Tokubi to death. It is nice how you can move your character during battle though, so I can stare directly into his soul as I defeat him. But now, finally after 15 minutes of slow dialogue, we travel to the Obsidian Firelands and get to catch some Pokemon, though it's still kinda just a tutorial. Here Ray teaches us how Pokemon catching works, which comes down to some Pokemon are friendly and will just watch you as you catch them, while others will run away or try to fight you, so you need to sneak up on them like we do for this Starly. He also teaches us about trees, which can house nice subscribe buttons, and Ray thinks you should click one if you enjoy the content. Okay, but seriously, they have berries or apricots which can be used to feed Pokemon and make items. So when we see a tree with berries, we can collect them by throwing a Pokemon at it. And now our last task here is to catch Shinx, who attacks trainers if it sees them. So we can throw a Pokemon at Shinx, damage them a bit, and finally catch them like in a normal Pokemon game. And with that, we completed the mission and get to go back to Jubilife, where Silene officially makes us a member of the Galaxy team, we get some new clothes, meet Commander Kamado, a man who likes throwing girls on the ground, and learn how to craft things like Pokeballs. But now finally, after all of that, we get to actually play the game. The tutorial is, for the most part, done. And because of that, let's talk about how progression works. The most important part of this game is we have a star rank in the Galaxy team. Currently, we have no stars and can't explore the world because of that. But we can increase our star rank by completing research tasks for Pokemon. This includes catching, fighting, using specific moves, feeding, all types of stuff. Each time we complete one of those tasks, we gain a research level on that Pokemon and some star points to rank up. Then, if we reach research level 10 for a Pokemon, we get an extra 100 star points since that basically means the Pokemon's data has been completed. So our goal is to complete research level 10 for as many Pokemon as possible. And one last thing with the system is every Pokemon has a few tasks that give double the research levels. For example, Starly gives double the research levels on number caught and number evolved, so focusing on those can get things done much faster. But alright, that's the main gist of the system, and now we can continue going through the speedrun. For this next excursion, we want to reach star rank 1 to progress the story as soon as possible. And for this, we want to catch 4 Wurmples, 2 without them seeing us, 6 Starlies, five without them seeing us in one Ponyta, while also feeding a Ponyta berries five times. We also want to catch any Bidoofs that we see on the way, since we want to catch 12 by the end of the game. To do this efficiently, we focus on the Wurmples first, since we want four in our party to gain experience, so we can evolve them in a bit. Then we do a cool trick where we catch all the Starlies in this area before talking to Ray to get some tips about those Starlies, which respawns them. That way we can finish the Starly tasks really quickly. Now we run over to Ray again, and he shows us a Buizel that wants to battle, similar to how Shinx is. So we can use two quick attacks with our Shinx, throw a Pokeball, and get an easy catch. Then we talk to Ray one last time, where he gives us a portable crafting pouch, and all we need to do now is finish up the Ponyta tasks. With all this done, I amass 640 research points, which means we can get to star rank 1 and continue the story after some more dialogue and jubilife. So here we go. We go to Silene to get our rank up before going to sleep again. 
The next day, Ray challenges us to a Pokemon battle. He only has a level 10 Pikachu, so we can just overwhelm him with numbers. We start the battle by sending out our Shinx and get two quick attacks in before dying. Then all we need to do is clean up with Oshawott, and yeah, Ray still kinda sucks. But now it's time to go back to the Obsidian Firelands and evolve all of our Wurmples. We're hoping to get two Cascoons and two Silcoons for maximum research points, which surprisingly, I got. This barely ever happens, so this was now a great start. We then switch our party to Oshawott, Shinx, Starly, Ponyta, Buizel, and Silcoon before heading over to Ray and Mai, a member of the Diamond Clan, one of the big groups in this game. And we also reached 12 caught Bidoofs on the way there, so that's pretty cool. Anyways, Mai wants to test us with a battle immediately after meeting her, but again, it's against a single Pokemon. To beat her Munchlax, we start out with Sphinx and spam Quick Attack. Then, once Sphinx gets taken out, we can finish out with Oshawott pretty easily by using a few Aqua Jets. Oh, and another thing I should mention for this game is if our Pokemon is really fast or uses a fast attack, we can sometimes attack twice in a row, so that helps us secure the win. And with that battle, Mai completely trusts us now for some reason and asks us to help her with calming down an Alpha Cricketoon. Our iPhone also wants us to do this, so it looks like it's our next mission. And on the way to Cricketune, we want to feed four Cricketots and catch two without them seeing us, and also catch a Stantler to use in a little bit. But now it's time to fight Cricketune, and we lead with Buizel. We can use a couple Aqua Jets until Buizel faints, and finish off the fight with some Ponyta Embers. So we beat that Pokemon, and can now set up a base camp here, which acts as a fast travel point. We also see Weirdeer, who now likes us, but he won't be important till a bit later. Now we get sent back to Jubilife, sleep, and wake up to the leaders of the Diamond and Pearl clans fighting. These two people are Adaman and Arita, and they'll be important throughout the story. And also important immediately after this, since we go up to Commander Commodo's office and see them fighting about the frenzied noble Pokemon Cleavor, so we receive a mission to calm him down. That means it's time to go back to the Obsidian Firelands and replace Buizel for Stantler. We also want to buy a bunch of Pokeballs here, just because it's a convenient place. Now on our way to Cleavor, we have a few more research tasks to complete. We want to defeat three Parises with a fire move, and catch four more. Feed Baneeris four times, and catch one, and feed Psyducks five times, and catch one. We'll also be taking the same path a bit later in the game though, so for the research tasks we don't completely finish now, we can do in a bit. Then we see Leanne, the person tasked to take care of Cleavor. But he doesn't trust us yet, so it's time for another battle but it's not much of a battle since we can just bite his Gumi twice with Shinx. And now he trusts us, hooray. But we still need to find out a way to calm down Cleavor. So we go all the way back to Jubilife where Professor Laventon will figure out that we can calm down the Pokemon by throwing their favorite food at them, which I guess it kinda makes sense. Now it's time to go back to the Obsidian Firelands. And once we get there, we gain the ability to ride Weird Ear, which makes us much faster. Before we use him though, we want to evolve our Silcoon and switch it out for a Cascoon to start leveling that up. And since we didn't get a fast travel point by Lian, we have to take the same path back, completing the leftover research task while riding a deer. But apparently, beating Lian still isn't enough to get the Pearl Clan to trust me, because now Arita wants to fight. But she just has a single Glaceon, because no one has multiple Pokemon for some reason, and we can beat it with a few Embers from Ponyta and Tackles from Stantler once Ponyta faints. And after all that, it's finally time for our first boss fight. In this fight, we have an unlimited amount of Forest Bombs and just keep throwing them at Cleavor. Most of his attacks are easy to dodge, and we can make the fight even easier by getting the Pokemon to stay in this general area so he doesn't run too far away. The game also really wants us to battle Cleaver at certain times, but it doesn't really help other than stunning him for a bit, so we just keep throwing bombs instead. And there we go, that's the first boss fight done. Then we want to evolve all of our Pokemon except for Cascoon, since we want to do that at night for extra research points. And since we did so many research tasks on the way, once we talk to the professor again, we rank up to star rank 2 and can continue the story without any extra grinding. But before that, it's everyone's favorite time, unskippable dialogue time. So we go to Captain Kamado, listen to his praise, have some dinner, and then meet Vesa. Vesa tries to tell us about some prophecy or something, and how we need to collect a bunch of wisps around the world, so we collect this one over here, and then proceed to never get any again. Too much extra work for me. We also now have the Jinko merchants in town who sell rare items like berries. So this is the perfect spot to buy a bunch of Oron berries since we'll be doing a lot of feeding research tasks in the speedrun. Then finally, we see a conversation by this new character, Arezu, and Commander Kamado. 
Arezu is explaining that another Pokemon, Ursaluna, is now frenzied, so that's our next mission. This opens up the Crimson Mirelands, but before we make it there, it's time for another rival fight. We start out by using some embers with Ponyta to get a bit of damage, and switch to Luxio once Ponyta faints. Then we bite Mime Jr. for a while, and do the same to Pikachu, winning the battle. Oh, by the way, one thing I should probably mention is another possible research task for Pokemon is seeing them do certain moves. Like for example, seeing Luxio use Bite. I won't mention all the times we do this since it would get complicated, but feel free to check out the run notes I was using in the description, as well as the speedrunner who made them, it's Victor. But now we made it to the Crimson Mirelands, and right away we want to rest till the night, since different Pokemon come out at night. We also want to evolve our Cascoon here, before depositing both Dustox and Ponyta, just leaving their spots empty. And that's because we're going to be filling those spots with some Gastlys. Here we need to catch 3 Gastlys, with one of the first two being level 18 or higher, so it knows a move we'll need. Then we'll also stun a Carnivine, which is another possible research task for some Pokemon, and catch it with a Heavy Ball before heading over to the Silesian Ruins. Which is where we meet Caliba, who doesn't trust us since we use Pokeballs. Then immediately after that sad conversation, Volo decides to battle us. Here we use our newly caught Ghastly to start, so Venoshock can one-shot his Togepi. He'll then defeat the Ghastly, so we switch to Staravia, and finish it off with some Aerial Aces. After the battle, Volo will ask us to retrieve a stolen wall fragment that someone took from the Silesian Ruins. Luckily, we don't need to travel too far away until we find a campfire and the Misfortune Sisters. These bandits are basically off-brand Team Rocket and not too much of a fight. So we take on Coin, who takes two arrow aces to defeat. The first one being in Agile mode to let us do two moves right after each other. And oh, I'm just realizing I never explained Agile in Strong Style, but it's pretty simple. After a Pokemon is leveled up with a move for a while, they'll master it. They can then learn Agile Style, which makes it weaker, but your next move sooner, and Strong Style, which makes it stronger, but your next move later. We use this a few times in the run, but it's not too important. So yeah, we got the Wall Fragment back, though it's still kinda confusing why the bandits took it in the first place. But anyways, on the way to bring it back, we also want to defeat two Carnivines with a flying type move. Then we go back to the ruins, and this single act makes Kalaba trust us and agree to let us calm down Ursaluna. So we get a new map marker and get going. We do stop on the way to feed six Hippobatases though, and these guys are really annoying to deal with since they're sometimes able to notice you in the grass, but we give them the food in a fairly optimal way and catch one of them before our battle with Ursaluna. And for this battle, Ursaluna is way too overpowered for our weak Pokemon. But we can start with using Staravia Aerial Aces until it dies. Then we switch to Duat and use some water moves to bring down the- Oh, Ursaluna just critted me, didn't he? So I came up with this scuffed solution of switching to Ghastly, reviving Duat, and then finally finishing off the fight. Gotta love the AI's luck. This also unlocks Ursaluna as a new rideable Pokemon for us who can smell out treasure and people. Too bad we won't use him a single time. But before we head back to report this mission, it's time to grind some more research tasks. We start by going left to a place with a bunch of Teddy Ursas. We want to feed three of them and catch two. Then we go up this wall by the Teddy Ursas and spam jump to Skyrim horse our way up to the top of this cliff. Now we have a cool trick where we can cross a river by jumping from this point all the way to the other side, which lets us catch a bunch of cool Pokemon. We're going to be focusing on making it to the flower garden here though, as there are a bunch of Petalils and Pachirisus. Now we want to feed 7 Petalils and catch 3, using stealth for at least 2 of those captures. And for Pachirisu, we feed 4 and catch 1. We also got really lucky and found a Tokubi here, which only happens every once in a while. So we can feed it 4 times and catch it to get a bit of extra star points as well. So yeah, really easy and quick points, and now we go back to the professor to get them before returning to the village. Once we're in Jubilife, we let Commander Kamado know how our mission went, but of course, there's already another problem. Now a second noble Pokemon, Lilligant, is frenzied and its warden, Arezu, is nowhere to be found. So we need to find a Reverse Luna, though again, we don't use our Saluna since we're speedrunning. So we go back to the Crimson Mirelands and switch out our higher level Ghastly for a Teddy Ursa and rest until morning. Then on the way to Arezu, we want to feed three Badoos and catch one with Stealth before also defeating a Psyduck with a Luxio Thunderfang. Then we'll awkwardly climb this hill with Weird Ear and feed and catch three Tangelas before finally talking to Arezu and hearing her out. And after that, it's time to travel to Lilligan, which is another pretty simple run to our destination while catching a few Pokemon on the way. 
In this time, we want to stun and then catch four Rhyhorns, teach our Stantler Psy Shield Bash, and then defeat four Roselias with Psychic moves. Roselias are also really annoying to defeat since they constantly run away from battles, which can get really annoying. But eventually, the task is done and it's time for Lilligan. And it's just like the last boss fight. We throw a bunch of Marsh Bombs, try to stay as close as possible to the Pokemon, and dodge all attacks. Lilligan's moves are pretty easy to dodge since you'll always jump before them, so the boss fight ends pretty quickly. But before we report the results of the mission and head back to Jubilife, we want to complete some research tasks for one last Pokemon. So we travel to the Shrouded Ruins, where we want to feed 5 Ralts and catch one with Stealth. This doesn't make Ralts reach research level 10 just yet, but we'll finish that a bit later. Actually, a lot of Pokemon use this strategy too, like how we still need to catch a Roselia, but it's better to do it later, and it just goes to show how well thought out this route was. So yeah, we TP back to camp, deposit all of our Pokemon except for Staravia, and go back to Jubilife since we have enough points to reach Star Rank 3. Once we're back in Jubilife, we tell Commander Kamado about what happened and sleep for the night before getting our next mission, which is to go to the Cobalt Coastlands, which currently doesn't have a Lord since the last one died. But people are suspicious about a shadowy figure on Fire's Pit Island. So we start heading out, but also pick up some more Oran Berries on the way since we'll be needing them. Now once we make it to Cobalt Coastlands, immediately Arita challenges us. And for some reason, a random Eevee also joins the battle and we just kinda have to accept it. But that means it's actually faster to lose this battle instead of winning it. That's why we only have Staravia in our party, so we can lose quickly. It is pretty funny though since Arita still acts like she lost the battle afterwards. But now we can get our full team again, which is going to be Duat, Staravia, Luxio, Teddy Ursa, and two Ghastlies. We'll also buy a few more Pokeballs to be set for the rest of the run. Now we start this story mission by fighting the Warden of this land, Paulina. But on the way, we have a bunch of research tasks to complete. First, we feed four Glammeows and catch one. Then we feed six Feels and also catch one. As we go through, we'll also catch a single Skaroopy and a Beautyfly before Skyrim horsing our way up this cliff to get a Growlithe. Just like a lot of these Pokemon, we'll want to feed the Growlithe four times before catching it, but this quick sequence just got us a ton of star points. And now we get to talk to Paulina, the warden that's taking care of the late lord's children, who are still Growlis. We tell her that we want to visit Fire's Pit Island to investigate the shadowy figure, and she recommends that we get the help of Basque Legion, a Pokemon that will let us swim, and to find her friend Ice Scan to do that. So we'll head over to Ice Scan's tent, while defeating two Buizels on the way with Thunder Fang, and also feeding six Apoms, and catching three more so we can finish its task after evolving one later. And now, it's time to beat Ice Scan. He tells us that he can help us, but we'll need to collect Basque Legion's favorite food, which can only be acquired by using a Dusclops. So we wait until nighttime before going to find one of those near the shipwrecks. On the way to it though, we'll also want to catch a Drifloom and defeat another with a dark move and catch a Dustox. Also for some reason, the Dustoxes gave me so much trouble during this run. But hey, it's Pokemon, it can't all go perfect. Then once we make it to Dusclops, it's a pretty annoying catch since there's a lot of other Pokemon around that also try to attack us, so we just really hope it'll get in the ball fast. But after that, we can head back to Ice Scan and make the food. Now we'll want to TP back to camp and rest until night to reset the day. We'll also want to evolve our Teddy Ursa, both our Gastlys, and an Apom before heading out with the party of Dustox, Drifloom, Duat, Staravia, and Ursaring. Then, on the way to Basque Legion, we'll defeat three Skaroopies with Fire-type moves, and leave it at that, since we'll get the last defeat later in the run. Now at this point, we get a huge dialogue dump, but it all comes down to getting Basque Legion to help us before the Misfortune Sisters attack. They steal a Growlithe since they think it's going to be the next Lord, I think. Honestly, their objectives are always a little bit strange. But it's also really funny, because they chose the wrong Growlithe. We still want to rescue it though, so we have even more of a reason to visit Fire Spit Island. And now we can travel at sea, so that makes everything a lot easier. Now on the way to Fire Spit Island, we have two more Pokemon to complete research tasks with. First, we stop at this small island to feed Shellosses four times before catching three of them, one using stealth. After that, we head closer to Fire Spit Island until we arrive at this area where we want to catch four Finneons, one using stealth. Luckily, all the catches almost always count as stealth since the Pokemon are underwater, so this is pretty easy. Which now finally leads us to Fire Spit Island where we need to save the Growlithe. So we run straight to the Misfortune Sisters, and it's time to battle. We start off battling Clover, and for this fight we use Drifloom and Mystical Fire on our Obama Snow. 
When Drifloom dies, we can switch to Ursaring and finish off with Slash. Then for the coin fight, we send out Shellos and spam Mud Bombs until we win. And finally we fight Charm, who surprisingly has two Pokemon. We start by doing a bit of damage with Shellos until it faints. Then we want to switch to Dust Stocks so we can use a strong Poison Powder for some research tasks. Then after Dust Stocks faints, we bring in Duat, who can Water Pulse her right on to death. This makes her bring out Gengar, who takes out Duat, and we finish the collection of fights with a strong Ursaring Bulldoze. Now back in the story time, they want to use some revives and fight, but Paulino arrives with the other Growlithe, it gets angry, and evolves into Arcanine, so they run away. But now we need to deal with the frenzied Arcanine, so we make its favorite food and start fighting. And for this fight, it's pretty much the same strategy as usual. Stay close to the Pokemon and try to manipulate him into not running away. His moves are pretty easy to predict though, and we can beat the boss pretty quickly. That's boss fight number 3 done, and we want to head back to the camp where we can switch out our Dustox for Beautifly in preparation for a battle a bit later, and head back to Jubilife with enough points to make Star Rank 4. And of course, the next day we learn about the next Frenzied Noble that will be calming down, this time being Electrode. But the Warden for Electrode, Melly, also known as the worst character in the game, really does not trust us, so we need to fight Adaman to prove ourselves. And in this fight, it's another one where we need to fight both Adaman's Leafeon and a random Eevee. I do not know where these Eevees keep coming from. Now we start the fight out with Beautifly and use an Agile Silverwind into a regular Silverwind to beat Leafeon. Then we can use a strong Stun Spore on Eevee before being defeated, switch to Ursaring, and finish off with a Slash. But even after that, Melly still doesn't like us, but who cares what he thinks, it's time to go to the Coronet Highlands. But before our next journey, we meet with this game's move tutor, Zisu, so we can give our Ursaring Ice Punch and Drifloom Shadow Ball. We also talk to Arita, who introduces us to Warden Ingo. Ingo got teleported into this world like our character, and also has no memories of before then, but he's a pretty cool dude and agrees to help. And now that we're ready to explore the Coronet Highlands, we want to switch out Beautifly for Waltz and rest until evening before going straight over to Ingo, where Melly tries to stop and battle us since he's still being a jerk. We ignore him though, cause who cares what Melly thinks. But since he was angry, Melly removed all the lights from the cave we need to go through, so Ingo needs to guide us through it very, very slowly. But eventually it's done and we can exit. Next we have a short run over to Ingo again, and hey, guess what? Melly still wants to fight. And this time we actually decide to fight, I guess. But I made a mistake by starting with Duwa instead of Ursaring. Nothing bad came out of this mistake since I just switched over and hit a couple of bulldozes, but it was a bit scary. Now we have some more running and bits of lore that don't really matter until we meet up with Ingo for another time and see that there are some very tall cliffs. To climb them, we'll surely need a Pokemon's help, but Ingo randomly decides to battle us before solving that problem, and this is actually a pretty difficult battle for once. To start, we lead Drifloom versus his Machoke with an Adrial Calm Mine, Extra Sensory, and Mystical Fire to finally take it out. Then once he brings out his Tangela, he tries to revenge kill us, but just can't stop missing moves, so we Mystical Fire it to death. Finally, Gliscor comes out, defeats Drifloom, and we finish it out with a Duat Water Pulse. We now gain access to the next rideable Pokemon, Sneasler, who puts us in a basket on his back and climbs mountains for us, but we won't be using him just yet, since we have some more Pokemon to catch over to the left. Here's where we find a Skun Tank, who we need to stun three times and catch once. I also had the biggest scare of my life here, and almost got taken out by Pokemon, which would have sent us all the way back to the beginning of the Coronet Highlands. Thankfully I survived though, and we didn't lose too much time. And after that scare, we can swim more to the left into this area, where we can find Clefairies and Roselias. So we'll feed three and catch two Clefairies, and catch one Roselia to finish out its mission that we started a while ago. And now we can climb back over to our original destination and meet up with Melly another time. And he must really not like us since he wants to battle again. He also uses the extra wild Pokemon cheat to the maximum by getting both a Zubat and Skorupi on his side, so that's definitely fair. But we start out with Ursaring and Bodo's once before fainting since three Pokemon on one is just a great time. Then once he faints, we can switch to Gastrodon and finish off Skuntank and Zubat. Now with just one Pokemon left, we can send him Drifloom and use a Mystical Fire. And with that, it's finally time for the Electrode boss fight, even if Melly still isn't too thrilled about it. And the name of the game for this boss fight is to always be moving. 
Electrode spawns bombs on the ground, so we want to always be moving to not get hit by them. Electrode will also sometimes use this broken homing attack, which we just tank and slowly whittle down their health. So hooray, that's the fourth boss fight done, time to go back to camp. But before we leave, we want to get one last slash with Ursaring to finish off his task and evolve some Pokemon. First we evolve Dua and teach it both Night Slash and Caesar's Edge. And we also evolve both our Staravia and Routes before switching out Curlia for Skuntank. Now finally, with all that stuff done, we have enough research tasks to obtain Star Rank 5, which is going to be the last one we need to complete the game. We finally don't need to worry about remembering all these random missions to complete and can solely focus on going fast. So we return to Jubilife, sleep for a night, and get our next mission of exploring the Alabaster Icelands to quell the last frenzied noble, Avalug. But before we're able to head out, it's time for another rival battle. So we lead the fight with our Skun Tank against Ray's Mr. Mime and beat it with Poison Jab. Then Staravia will come out, so we just do another Poison Jab and beat that too. But Pikachu will revenge kill us, and we need to send out Gastrodon to use an Earth Power and finish this fight off. Now in Alabaster Icelands, we run straight to our next objective, and once we arrive, we see our next warden, Garrick, who like everyone else in the world, wants to battle in order to trust us. For this fight, we start off with Samurott and just Night Slash Frost Slash. Then we still have to deal with Glalie, so we'll use a Seasless Edge for regular turn damage. Once Samrot faints, we can finally clean up with a Drifloom Mystical Fire, gaining Garrick's trust. But Garrick tells us, to quote Avalug, we'll need to retrieve Eternal Ice. And to get that Eternal Ice, we'll definitely need the help of a new rideable Pokemon, Braviary, who we can get from a girl named Sabby. And right on time, Sabby shows up with Braviary, but to gain her trust, she wants to play some tag. So we catch her once, and she flies away to a new place. And basically, we do this a few times until we finally arrive at Snowpoint Temple. In here, we need to complete a bunch of wall puzzles. For the first one, we press the panels in the order of Rock, Steel, Ice, the second one in Ice, Rock, Steel, Rock, Ice, and the third one in Steel, Ice, Rock, Ice, Steel, Rock. But even after all that, Sabi still doesn't trust us, so it's time for a Pokemon battle. And this one is extra dumb because she uses Rhyperior, Electivire, and Magmortar all at the same time. So for this one, we start out with Gastrodon and take out Electivire with Earth Power. After Gastrodon dies, we use an Ursaring Bulldoze. And finally, once Ursaring dies, we'll use a Samurott Water Pulse to win the fight. But even after this battle, Savvy and Braviary still don't trust us. So now we have to defeat Braviary. This battle is thankfully less dumb though, and we lead Samurott against Braviary using some Night Slashes. Then Samurott dies, and we clean up with some Drifloon Shadow Balls, finally gaining the power to fly. So we now fly over to the Eternal Ice and get a piece, before seeing that Garrick somehow got here too, cause he's an absolute unit. Then we have to fly over to him again, have some more unneeded dialogue, and finally get the chance to fight Avalug. And out of all the frenzied nobles in this game, for me, Avalug is the hardest. Not really for his attacks though, more because of the camera angle. Since we constantly want to throw snow bombs, it's really hard to judge the distance of Avalug's attacks with the camera angle. Then, to make it worse, Avalug will sometimes use attacks that sprout from the ground, so we have no way of telling where those are besides for not throwing anything for a while. Overall, an okay noble fight, but not perfect. We eventually get it done though, and there we go. We have now quelled all 5 frenzied nobles. And yep, that looks like the end of the game to me, so let's just go to sleep and what happened to the sky? So yeah, apparently the world is now in apocalypse mode, and the sky is doing some really weird things. And because of this, Commander Kamado decides to blame us for this happening, which is definitely not right. I've done all this work to help you, and you're blaming me. I mean, it kinda makes sense since I did come from a rift in the sky, but it's still not right, and we get kicked out of Jubilife. The Professor, Ray, and Silene thankfully still want to help us though, so at least they see us out of town and command that we don't die? Yeah, that's definitely gonna help. So it's time to try to find a place to stay. We ask Lian, and he says no. We ask Mai, and she says no, and then we kinda just give up and look defeated, but the boy Volo comes to our rescue. He knows someone who is willing to help, since they realize that we're like, the chosen one or something I guess, and that's when we meet Kojita, who tells us that we need to complete the trials of Uxi, Mesprit, and Azelf. Then, both the Diamond and Pearl Clan leaders, Adamant and Arita, also decide to help us, since they aren't dumb like our commander but we only get to choose one of them to travel with us, so we choose Adaman. Now our next mission is going to be meeting up with the three Lake Guardians so we can obtain something called the Red Chain and save the world. 
And for this, we need to visit three different caves, open them up with our smartphone, and fight a Pokemon. The first one is in the Obsidian Firelands, where we need to fight Gudra. In this fight, we start with Ursaring and use Bulldoze until Ursaring faints. We did get bad luck and miss our move though, so that wasn't great, but we were able to switch to Star After, use Close Combat, and still win in the end. And then Mesprit shows up and asks a bunch of questions. We just mashed through them though, and obtained Mesprit's Plume. Next, we head to the Alabaster Icelands, where we need to fight a Zorark. In this fight, we use Samurott and Night Slash Zorark to death. Then Uxie comes out, wanting to test our knowledge, so they ask how many eyes a bunch of different Pokemon have, which we can answer with 60131, and obtain Uxie's Claws. Finally, we go to the Crimson Mirelands, where we need to fight an Overquill. We lead with our Gastrodon, and use Earth Power until Gastrodon faints. Then we can finish off with an Ursaring Bulldoze, and win yet another fight. That makes Azelf come out, and we get a really strange test where we need to keep throwing Marsh Bombs at Azelf, and they keep dodging. They'll then ask a few times if we want to continue, which we always say yes, eventually hitting them. And with that, we now obtain Azelf's Fang, and the Lake Trials are done. So now it's time to head over to the Shrouded Ruins. Once we make it here, Azelf, Mesprit, and Uxie also come by and create the Red Chain. And with that, we can finally go back to Jubilife and let Kamado know that we made some progress with solving the Sky issue. Except he decided to go off on his own and try to deal with the problem himself. Yeah, probably not the best idea. So we go after him to Mount Coronet, but on our way we get stopped by Benny, the guy who refused to let us eat food at the beginning of the game. Turns out him and Kamado have some sort of connected pass, and he's a ninja or something like that, so we need to defeat him to go on. With this fight, we start with Samurott, but get drowsy with Hypnosis, and we don't get to attack at all since drowsiness is awesome! So I had to play the rest of the fight on the fly, and we sent out Drifloom, using a couple of Shadow Balls to take out Miss Magius. Next, Benny sent out Gardevoir, which we Shadow Balled once, and then lost Drifloom. So we sent out Skuntank, and did a quick Poison Jab. Next, it's time for Sneasler, who uses Close Combat, and we get Annihilated. So I sent out Ursaring, since I didn't really know what to do, used the Bulldoze, and lost another Pokemon. Probably not my best decision. But Gastrodon was able to easily take out Sneasler until he got Drain Punched by Gallade, which was kinda dumb. Thankfully, we barely won the fight using a Brave Bird though, and my heart rate was finally able to go down. That was way too close. And right after that fight, it's time for an even tougher fight with Kamado, who will only let us handle the Rift if we beat him in a Pokemon battle. Kinda strange how people put so much trust in Pokemon battles, but whatever. For this fight, we start out with Ursaring against Braviary and can use two Ice Punches to deal with his first Pokemon. Then we have to fight Snorlax, who takes out Ursaring, and we switch in Staraptor to do some close combats and take out Snorlax. Then like clockwork, his Golem will take out our Staraptor, and we'll switch to Samurott to use a strong Water Pulse. Finally, Kamado's last Pokemon is Clefable, which is annoying since it has Draining Kiss. We use Skuntank to start, so it can do some damage with Poison Jab before dying. And then thankfully, we still had Gastrodon, which can damage Clefable just enough so Drifloom can win the battle with some extra sensories. It took a while, but we finally won. And that means it's time for the Dialga battle. Before it, we get 10 Ultra Balls to use, and go right into trying to catch Dialga. The plan is get Dialga under 50% health, and spam Ultra Balls until we eventually catch it. And we finally actually have a correctly leveled Pokemon for this area of the game. But Palkio decides to come raid on our parade, and we retreat away. This is followed by way too much talking, but it's basically just us deciding that we should get a certain stone that can make a special Pokeball and catch Palkia. But as soon as we get to the location of the stone, the Misfortune Sisters arrive again. Seriously. Even when the world is being destroyed, these useless bandits want to be mild inconveniences. We only need to fight Charm though, and hey, we have Dialga this time, so we can take out our Rhydon pretty easily. But then our Gengar uses Hypnosis, and... Uh, this game makes me so sad. We do finish out Gengar with a couple Night Slashes, but just why game? So with our new stone, we can go back to the lab, and have Professor Laventin make the Origin Pokeball. And with this, we can finally beat the game with only one more Dark Souls boss fight. Now the first thing you might notice about this fight is what did they do to my boy Palkia? But the second thing you might notice is that Palkia has some pretty big attacks. 
so we take the strategy of moving a lot and dodging when necessary to slowly whittle down its health. And after all that, we capture Palkia, and that's our last fight. As soon as we go through some more dialogue, we can end off time and get a 4, 58, 36. And that's sub 5 hours, which puts us at 10th place on the speedrun.com leaderboards, which I'm pretty happy with. Subscribe if you enjoyed.